it's easy to fall in love with the world of fashion, but it's hard to accept that it's one of the world's most polluted industries. The way our fabrics are made and our growing appetites fed by fast fashion all lead to severe environmental challenges. China Daily talks with Hong Huang, a media figure who has covered the industry for 20 years, to search for a sustainable future for fashion. As ambassador of the Franco-Chinese Month of the Environment, she is a strong believer economic growth and eco protection can go hand in hand. If we look closely to today's aesthetics, sartorial practices inspired by traditional Chinese culture may hold the answer. You are the ambassador of the Franco-Chinese Month of the Environment. So, what are the most important messages you would like to convey to the public? I think a lot of people tend to feel environmental protection somehow restrain is a restraint on economic growth. In fact, environmental protection and sustainable economic growth is the only way that we can move forward. And will actually generate a lot of job opportunities, a lot of,、um, and will be a wealth creation machine. I used to work in fashion industry. You know, as 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 the moderator had pointed out, fashion is the second most source, second biggest source of pollution、um, in the world. So it is a very quote unquote dirty industry. So we see, for example, Kering Group. Which is a French company,、um, which owns brands like Gucci, like Balenciaga, and all these brands, very big luxury brands, and they have taken a huge initiative to be environmental friendly. And we also have a great example of a Chinese company called Icicle. They are so environmentally friendly, and they have been ever since they were founded because the owner. Um, are very entrenched in Chinese tradition, so they are totally believers of、um, this Chinese saying called 天人合一 that this, that men and nature must be compatible. They used very traditional old Chinese belief system that has been here for thousands of years, and you realize. Guess what? We were right in the first place. It's just in the middle, you know, with all these industrialization、uh, and growth, we might have forgotten a little bit what our ancestors have always believed in. And so it's good to see people going back to that. In order to move forward, you just go back. Churchill once said,、um, "The further back you can go, look, the more clear is the future." So I think this is very true. You know, the further back we can go in our own tradition, the more clear we will see what is the future of of for us. Yeah, and what matters the most. Right. Exactly. And I'm so glad you mentioned the fashion industry because it actually connects us all, every single one of us in this society. Yeah. But the pollution and waste caused by this industry is actually rarely mentioned in China because I talked to some of my friends and they were surprised. So I was thinking, how serious is this current situation right now, and how can we、um, make more people to realize? Probably like 30, 40 years ago, 35 years ago, fast fashion was invented. You know,、um, it was invented in America because everybody fashion is a way of self-expression. Everybody wants to express themselves, so everybody needs to change clothes every season to be fashionable. All that has increased the amount of consumption. Really, honestly, when I was a child in China. You buy a piece of clothes until that piece of clothes cannot no longer be worn. You wear it until worn out. It's worn out, and that's the natural way, and that is the more environmentally friendly way. As much as we all enjoy going to a fast fashion store and be able to afford whatever we want to buy, but the kind of Damage that we're creating in the environment 
it's horrible. And also because fast fashion is not only exploitative about natural resources, it is also exploitative of human labor uh, because they pay very low wages to the factory workers. Um, so they work in very bad condition. Um, so fast fashion has really bad impact on both the environment and also the um, third world um, population in general. How would you arrange your wardrobe? What would you do with the old clothes? Well, I am in some ways um, kind of lucky uh, in the Why? sense the fact that nobody has my size because I'm fat, I'm overweight or I'm chubby. Um, so I can go to Zara and just buy medium size. It won't fit me, right? So for me, I have to think about what I want to wear. And I have, I have a, I have some, I have, you know, I'm, I have a tailor, a friend of mine who actually cuts clothes and makes her own, makes clothes. And, and she's been making clothes for myself, my friends, my family for like the past 20, 30 years. I lost her for a while. And um, because when I was skinnier, I did buy fashion a lot. But now that I'm actually, I've, I'm, 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 I'm more like I cannot buy off the rack. I find it really pleasant and fun to actually be able to go buy a fabric and then work out with her what kind of clothes I want to wear. And those clothes are actually, you know, because it's, it's troublesome, you know, you have to go through a lot of process. So you tend to keep those clothes a lot longer. And today I think it was very inspiring for me that people are making things out of their old clothes. I think I might try that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to try, try it with my tailor to take some old clothes and try to play with it. It should be fun. From uh, I Look Magazine to uh, later the brand new China, that time you want to give um, Chinese designers a voice and uh, more public profiles. After working with so many Chinese designers, what do you think is the secret to make Chinese design stand out in a global fashion? I think design and art and culture and aesthetics and history and everything, it's all interlinked. So if you're a designer and if you're only looking at the four major fashion weeks today to say, oh, what is in vogue and, you know, I got to do whatever, you know, if it's checkers or it's played right now this season, then, you know, we, we got to do played and you will always be a follower and you're not a trend maker. So to be a trend maker, you need, again, to look into your own culture. And this is one thing that I am hoping that Chinese designers will do more because out of all the cultures around the world, I think the least exploited or the least utilized will be Chinese culture. And we have an extremely rich culture in fashion, in the way that Chinese people look at clothes. First of all, we are not exhibitionists. We, we look at clothes more functionally rather than showing off. And we are very particular about clothing that fits a certain occasion. So we are very, we're very economical in terms of what we wear. And we're very, um, and then we have this very fancy robe that's outside that we use for ceremonies. So that kind of tradition actually is passed down um, up until a point. Uh, unfortunately today, um, I would encourage Chinese designers to look into that a lot more um, because fashion is changing. So the way people buy clothes, the way people make clothes, the way people trade clothes um, are all going, are all changing. So there's huge opportunity for new designers. 
Um, because if you still think in the old mode, it's like, oh, I got to do two collections and I got to do a runway show and stuff like that. This is, I think this is for the past because right now it's not like that. I need to, you know, get orders and build stock and go into a department store and all that. The distribution channels have changed. Everything is changing. So this is a great time to be a fashion designer, but you have to be sensitive to the sea change that is going on in the fashion industry right now. And the change is actually deeply influenced by the taste and the favor of young generations. So do you think uh, young people today in China want the same thing as people, young people from, let's say, 20 or 30 years ago? Young people in China today are very globalized. Um, but the more globalized they are, the more they appreciate their own culture. So it is, you know, people tend to think globalization means everybody like the same thing. It actually is exactly the opposite. Because there is diversity, people begin to appreciate their own culture. Um, let me give you an example. In the Chinese mobile phone industry, um, and also in the internet industry, um, two companies, Huawei and Alibaba, have used a lot of images and references and quotes from um, Shanghai Jing. Yeah. So young people, because they're into electronics and they're into internet e-commerce, they're very, they, they, they inspire them to have a renewed interest in Shanghai Jing and what it represented, what it represents in Chinese culture. It's actually a Chinese myth, right? And so, so when this Chinese myth comes back to life, all kinds of imagery come back to life. And these imagery might not be alive in everyday life anymore. For example, my generation, who are not familiar with it, all of a sudden, you know, the next generation are really into it. They're really into Chinese myth. Look at the box office of Nuja, right? And th this kind of rekindling of um, traditional and classic Chinese myths and beliefs and certain lifestyle is great. It's fantastic. And it's part and parcel of globalization. It's not despite globalization, it is because there's globalization. It all of a sudden you realize you need your own identity. So therefore you search deeper into your own culture. And I remember last year from your press conference, Ms. Zhang, and somebody asked you about um, a piece of advice that you can give to women. And you said, take in charge of your own life. But it's not really easy, is it? Well, it's not that hard. I, I think a lot of people are doing that. Um, I think, you know, um, basically, I think a lot of women are... N step number one, be financially independent. Be economically, financially, support yourself. You know, don't ask your parents for money. Don't ask a man to support you. Don't ask anyone to support you. Be able to earn a salary, live on that salary, and be able to make a living for yourself. Independence, that's financial independence, is very key for women to gain their ultimate independence. And this has been like that for the past 100 years, ever since women's suffrage. The fact that you know the women's independence has to be with women's financial independence. So, so I think that's that's very key. And I think most Chinese women are, have taken that first step already. And then I think it becomes a little bit more difficult because your parents will say, get married, why aren't you having a baby? Or, and you're gonna marry someone, and they'll say, look, you know, instead of you don't make that much money, and so that, you know, you stay home and take care of the baby and we can use, you know, you know, what you make will just basically pay for Ai anyway. And so why don't you just stay home? So 
it's okay. Women have a lot of choices. You just have to be smart in making choices. I remember reading. I think I met a French minister. I think who had nine kids. It was unbelievable. So I think from that aspect,、um, women can do a lot. You, we're lucky. We're in a culture that women going to work is very acceptable. Yes. Whereas in some cultures, women driving is still a novelty. So, you know, women going to work and being part of society is not a problem in China. It's a fact, very much encouraged. And so I, I, I think just. It's us. We have to do it.